Going we'll, for a while. we'll all just clap on the count of three. We'll all clap. We'll all clap on the count of three. Are you ready? Yeah. One. One. Two. two three. <laughs> Ryan, did you clap? We didn't hear it. Yeah, I, I have a headset on. I'm trying to clap like right. Oh, next perfect. To the okay, none of us clap, but I'm glad you did. But no, okay. I didn't. He- I didn't hear it. Yeah, cool. the editor doesn't actually need a clap, but if you can clap, yeah, some more. we were just with yeah. you. We thought it'd be funny to make. Oh, that's clap. fine. No, I don't care. DJ man. Paper magic will survive like the heat death of the universe. And will... Oh, it's a smuggler's copter. Would you like to crew this? And then it crashes because they don't understand arithmetic. All your cards belong to me. Two minutes into macing them in the eyeballs, I switched to pepper spray. And he's like, yeah, it's downright refreshing. And went back to the mace. Magic is dying. I'm done. I'm selling everything. <laughs> I might be a hoarder. And yes. I don't have the crayons or glue to explain this to you right now. <laughs> what, are you going to die twice? Oil Just... will be worthless before magic cards will. Well, okay, Dr. Man. That's Mr. <laughs> Dr. Professor Jason. Start whenever you want, man. It's not going to stop us from talking. Hello, everybody, does. and welcome. It never does. You're right, DJ. That's a good point. <clears throat> Got my voice warmed up. Hello, everybody, Take and two, welcome. Take two, everybody. Back Take two. Let's be quiet. Let's not step on Corbin's intro. Good for 2024 that we're doing. The 2014 bit. Green Day's relevant again and so is jason's decade old bit remember when i kicked corbin out of the discord i'm not part of the corbin agenda <laughs> i was wondering why corbin was like one of the more recent ads when i saw that i got added onto the discord i was like i was i was i i think i was um pointing out something semantic corbin annoying and dj didn't list. like it dj I didn't, didn't know, like it's it it's not that i didn't like it i just gave you three and you went over the three <laughs> limit so i kicked him from the call while me and jj and went, corbin were went recording a podcast i think i went two and then we <laughs> JJ and I were dying laughing and Corbin was salty. No, that's not what happened though. These idiots are like, I thought he would just rejoin. Where is he? I saw that I couldn't rejoin. I didn't have an invite <laughs> to my own server. So I just got just, up and like went and just, got a drink and came back in. Funnier. Still didn't have an invite left and said, I can come back if you guys want. <laughs> Which is even funnier. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Brainstorm Brewery. If you made it through the uh, new wow, year... Wow, Corbin, really? Hello, everybody, even Nazis, really? Everybody? Wow. Everybody. I don't think Nazis listen to this podcast, so... It's called the Paradox of Tolerance, Corbin. You should probably look it up. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Percentage-wise, there's enough listeners that you probably have at least one Nazi listening. Oh, man. Well, uh, on that note, everybody, welcome not in. Not anymore. I would hope not anymore. To 2024. Like magic finance more than they don't like how much I don't like them. Brainstorm sure, Brewery but... is off to a roaring start here. Welcome to 2024. Yeah. Shoot off the fireworks. Welcome into the show, everybody. I'm Corbin. That's DJ in the Ristic okay. Study shirt. Shout out there. Jason's pouring a beer. And that other voice you hear uh, is what we would call a podcast host emeritus. Going back to Demetrius. I understand. This is not. Yeah, I understand. So going back to the <laughs> uh, the original episode one, of Brainstorm Brewery. You will find on that episode not Jason, not DJ, but me and Ryan, along with Marcel. So that is what you get. Going back, Brainstorm Brewery history. We've got Ryan on the show this week. Ryan Bouchard, welcome in. What's up, my guy? What's up? Yeah, speaking of episode one, I got to say, I have a number of friends now who have like started podcasts or I talk to about, you know, different podcast ventures and the amount of time and effort and planning that goes into podcasts nowadays. And I'm not talking about like for each individual episode, but I'm saying like to even get it started and like put your podcast out there. Some people will spend like six months to a year doing all their planning and everything else before they even release their first episode. They'll have 15 episodes recorded, ready to go. Uh, We didn't do that. I think we had seven days from the first time somebody brought it up to when we recorded our first episode. Do you think that that we would do any of that today if we were starting a show? No, no. I mean, we'd have no listeners either. Like, I would just not start a show. It was a whole different time. Yeah, I mean, we were talking into tin cans. Don't go listen to episode one. (laughs) It's it's, so the uh, Commander's Herald podcast. Am I the Bull cast? Recorded like the first interview part of it, like months ago like i was i was hitting people up to do the cast like in minneapolis and that was like may or it was may it must have been may yeah so like we we had these interviews done in like june july and then the episodes are coming out now and it's (laughs) 
it's kind of embarrassing for me because I did drag my feet a little bit. But like like you said, there's so much that goes into starting a podcast now. It's not like it was when it's like, hey, Jason, want to be a guest on the podcast? We're recording sitting on the air conditioner in the hotel room. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Accidentally guested too many times. Now you're a host. Now you're a <laughs> <laughs> It's the three times guest rule. That's how we trap You're off your entry level contract. That's how we trap them for a decade. <laughs> Well, last week, uh, we, we did a special Christmas episode. We watched through Jingle All the Way, uh, which was a first for me. We watched Jingle All the Way Through It. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we uh, gave some commentary along with the listeners. So shout out to anybody who uh, who made it through that with us last week. That was a good time. It was a nice, relaxing time for us like to be able to put out a podcast episode, but not have the, sh the stress of trying to talk about magic when there is clearly no magic to talk about. Been but still having the stress of me showing up and they're like, you got a breaking bulk and a pick of the week, right? And me going, great. Now I have to try to find one of those while I'm watching this movie. It's very thematical. I have to find <laughs> one at the last minute. Well, <laughs> none of the magic stores are all open. the All the ones are taken. <laughs> There's nothing <laughs> left. Everything got reprinted. When I was at the liquor store over the weekend, I saw a Turbo Man beer. And I was like, I get it now. I wouldn't have got that reference. But you've seen the movie already. Sure. It's like, I saw the movie time. 20 years yeah, ago, but if man. You, it, listen, if, you, years if you showed me four pictures and be like, which one's the big bad Beetleborg? Which one's Turbo Man? Which one's, like, <laughs> Ultraman? Yeah, like, there's so many of just that generic thing that I, I couldn't do it. So, yeah. yeah. If if go. I didn't just see the movie, I wouldn't remember Turbo Man because I I think I said Ultraman at the beginning of the that recording. Mm, there you go. And isn't it turns out it was Turbo isn't Man. Ultraman, the like big in Japan. Yeah, the Japanese one from the the eighties. Yeah. 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 Okay. No clue. Just so that's to show you how insane it is that He Man caught on as a name. There were two He Mans though. Yeah. So like. Skeletor's there were literally, I was getting the wrong He-Man toys for Christmas. I, I like the Masters of the Universe He-Man and the other He-Man. I like spaceships and shit. And yeah. people were buying me spaceships and I was like. Well, that's such a crazy generic name for a hero. Yeah, go look at the 80s. There's a lot of generic name. Go look at the rock bands. Like there's, there's, there's a lot of. Nothing's ever been original. Romeo and Juliet was a play that Shakespeare based on an Italian play called Romeo and Juliet. Like, Very he didn't know anything about Denmark. He just, like, wrote Hamlet because somebody else wrote a play about Denmark. And he's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 it's a remix. That's Shakespeare. Is Shakespeare was a hack. Excuse? He was the Michael Bay of the 1400s, I said Is it. that wizard's excuse for the Phryxia story? Somebody already did it before. That's why it's bad. <laughs> somebody hey. saved the universe recently. The Phyrexian arc would have been fine if they spent two years on it instead of two sets. Woo! Like, it, as somebody coming back in, I was very confused about that. MTG Ryan checking into the chat. That's not a hot take. That's correct. I know. That's what everybody look, Ryan thinks. used to be the lore master on this show. Okay, I'll have yeah. You. Oh, I would have. I would have been livid through those episodes. I was like coming back in. That's about the time I really started focusing on magic again. And I was really hyped, right? Like, oh, we're doing all these. It was kind of like the perfect time to get back in to Magic because it was all these characters I knew and all this, like, cool lore base. Like, oh, I get that reference. It's Yumazawa's, like, relative or whatever and things like that. And uh, then they just dumpstered all of it. It's kind of like the end of War of the Spark. It was about as good as that book was. You know, Magic used to feel like going to the theater every three months and seeing a Marvel movie and being like, yeah, the next Marvel movie is going to be great. And now it feels like binging an entire season of Magic in one weekend on Disney Plus. Like, that's yeah. how it feels now is like, here's all the episodes. Binge them. Oh, you but guys have all your sets planned out for the next four years. Yeah, we got all the secret names like bow and arrow. Cool. All that's coming out this year. It's not even like you could binge it, though. It would be like if you took all the Marvel series that they've made on Disney Plus and you took one episode from each and let somebody watch that in a row. Like, that's about what it really felt like, because you didn't get enough yeah. of any of the storylines yeah. to care yeah. about any of the characters or yeah. to have an, a, any real idea of what was going on in the overall universe. You're just like, cool, lots of people who were enemies before are now friends and we're fighting some Phyrexians. Lots of people die. They lost some sparks. They 
gained some sparks, but so they're not dead. I don't know. That's why people yeah, yeah. La- latched on to Universes Beyond. It, like, we made fun of the concept of Universes Beyond years ago, but now it's like, the only thing I can follow is shit I already know. I already know Fallout, so yeah. these cards are going to be fun to read. I don't have to, like, be like, well, I'm, I missed a magic set, so, like, I will never catch up on the lore again. Okay. I, didn't, well, I didn't pay attention to after. I don't know how many people are paying attention to that stuff in the first place. In in spite of all of that, uh, I have, from my own experience personally, and from what I have seen anecdotally, I know I don't have, and, and I mean from what I've heard from Wizards and Hasbro and all that, like the game has grown, and I mean I've seen this at a personal level from local game stores, and I've seen that just on Reddit there was a thread recently that managed to climb its way to the top of the corpses that was just. Hey, it seems like there's a lot of very weirdly basic new player questions lately. Because Mm. there were just plenty of questions of just a grainy cell phone picture of a card printed last year that said, Hey, does does this plus one plus one counter go on this creature? Does that work that way? And everyone's like, Of course it does. Why wouldn't it? But like that that is the the end result of all of these players picking up a Warhammer deck and playing with their friends while reading a paper rule book. That, that is the, the trickle down of that is these oh. players entering the ecosystem and, Oh, learning about a magic subreddit and following magic TikTok and just slowly like what's a Jace, the mind sculptor like that, that is the, the corrosion of universes beyond through the rest of the world. Non magic world is getting those magic players into our world. And I've seen a lot more of that, both at the mm-hmm. local level and anecdotally from hearing about the, those evil quarterly reports over at Hasbro is like, Hey, we're selling cards. We're getting players. Yeah. It, it strips a layer mm-hmm. of what you don't understand away from the game, right? You're learning the rules of magic, but you don't have to learn magic's IP too. And right. it turns out by the way, there's not much worth learning when cards work the way you would expect them to work in a universe that's beyond. Um, I, I don't have a perfect example, whatever, but like, when well, like something the, the, works, Doctor Who, so it's all the time travel shit. Right? Well, that's what I was going to say. That was the first thing that came to mind. But obviously, that's very complicated, right? So I don't know if that's the best example. Uh, the Necron, think, oh, it's Necron a terrible example. No, what's the the woman's the River Song? That card is very, very thematically appropriate yes. from what I'm. Yes, because yes. I, I showed that card to yes. to somebody, and I, I'm a Magic player. I'm not a Doctor Who player. I showed that to a Doctor Who watcher who is not a Magic right. player. They've never touched Magic or a card game, and they're like, "Oh, that makes so much sense." It makes yeah. so much sense, and they've never read a Magic or played Magic game. It's literally just, if you go back to what Wizards always called their strongest designs historically, it, they, they talked a lot about top-down design, right? In a shroud gives you what you want out of what you expect that hits on all the tropes you expect out of that kind of world. They credited yeah. that concept a lot for its success. So it does extend to universes beyond, right? Like, it, River Song, working the way you expect River, like... The, the way when you look at it, you get it. You go, oh, that makes sense. That's an incredible moment that ties the two together for somebody um, in a way that doesn't exist if it's you know a random rocks from Alara. Uh, yeah, and I mean in regards to the Beyond Universe two, uh, hey, the Necron deck fantastic for just like a new player it's monocolor they don't have to think of anything like that very simplistic in what it does and some of them you know get into the doctor who and they become obviously much more complex but they're they're great decks in the like overall so like the one thing about our player base out here you know i'm kind of starting my story out in the country and it's a lot of like more casual players there's not people who are playing magic every day uh and so these guys don't want to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a commander deck so they're kind of we have one group that has kind of made like an in-house rule where they don't spend more than 200 dollars on a deck and then it also works out really well because the other group really wants to play with like mostly pre-cons. Maybe they'll upgrade them a little bit. And the Beyond Universe feels so good out of the box and all the art is so thematic that nobody really feels an aggressive incentive to upgrade them a lot. And so you yeah. end up with like people who are just having a good time jamming a pre-con. And, you know, like I bought in a bunch of pre-cons. Because any new card, the art's not going to match. And exactly. it ruins the, the experience, right? The, the Most people agree, I think, that especially in the uh, shared releases, like the or like the war camera stuff, right? For universe, that they were designed playing. to be played together as a board game, right? Exactly. Yeah. And as soon as you break that, even if you're, I want to put a couple lands in my deck because the mana sucks. You kind of just break that board game feel of it. Now it's just any other magic deck, which is fine. But back to Ryan's point, like you can buy a precon, do a precon for months, get get a few months out of that, and guess what? They're gonna have another set with another precon. You can explain. Well, and you can do and it that the same lets way. those people 
that lets those people have an organic way to evolve to yeah. I'm going to build my own deck. You get exactly. those precons, yeah. and then over the of course of a year, you have seven or eight precons. You're like, you know what? I'm gonna build my own. I'm a, mm-hmm. I'm a piece apart all of these, and just Tony Stark gonna cave this thing together and have it be my own creation. And then they find out where EH Rec is, and then it's a whole rabbit hole. And yeah, so, well, and you don't even have to Tony I, Stark imagine... it, right? Go ahead. I was gonna say so many rares nowadays that are very playable like back in the day when you got a box of bulk rares you, you could assure that like 80 percent of that was going to be hot trash you were never going to put it in a deck and now it's like 10 percent, right like because everything 90 percent of cards that <laughs> you read bulk. have something that could be usable yeah. and yeah and because everything is bulk there's so many more opportunity for people to just like take their deck that they really enjoy go through my quarter box of rares and spend ten dollars and have like a very playable like oh. arguably just as good as what you would pay for some of those more my expensive sweet decks. summer child you I think had people, that experience. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, you think people, you think people would be happy with cheap cards and building. Oh, decks they like are. That. A lot of people are. My Maybe player not, base, not so much, yeah. but I, I appreciate not on X. the people. Com, the not. people with Twitter yeah. accounts don't oh. play Magic, and that's who yeah. we're subjected. That's the opinion we're subjected. Yeah. To. So, but this is not the point. I, I bring that, that up to say this. Ryan is coming at this of somebody who does not live on Twitter, does not have to live and die by the whims of Magic social media. Ryan owns a small LGS out in the country, as he said, and is coming to it like in this moment is an LGS owner right now running things. You know, I closed yeah. mine years ago. We've all had experiences at different levels in the past, but Ryan is currently operating a store, which in addition to being, you know, an, an excellent former host of the podcast gives him uh, a lot of great insight into a lot of things we've talked about recently. On the show. Yeah. And commander decks, I can say through the last year about the only thing that are consistently always good margin and always good money versus and no matter what set they're coming from they always sell uh versus you know obviously the debacle is commander masters and everything else that's come out over the past year that might not move wilds of eldraine not a great set uh the commander deck still sold for me though and so yeah like you know if people are enjoying commander at a very like fundamentally not broken level it's very easy for them to continue to buy decks and then yeah eventually everyone kind of finds that one deck where they're like okay this is my deck i i just have uh, some sort of connection with how this plays i really enjoy it and this is the one i'm gonna like break this is gonna be my deck that's gonna become my tier one i bust this out when we're playing our really competitive decks yeah and Ryan. so, so, my, so my... tell us a, tell us a little more i mean like about the, the crowd at your store like what do you see your player base being most interested in what are they liking not liking sort of about I mean, we can say 2023, but like sort of where magic's at. So we're expanding out our play space right now because I'm kind of limited on how often I can run <laughs> events. Uh, and once I get things going, then I can have a lot more people in here. So it'll be a little bit more of a perspective. But just from my regulars that I come in, re- you know, all the time and are playing weekly, uh, they they have no interest in playing any constructed magic that isn't commander, first off. Like, I just don't have a player base out here that wants to even play like modern. I think I have a couple of guys that want to play legacy. But even then, like, how do you get the crowd that's interested in Commander to play Legacy? So the, uh, the standard uh, events that Wizards is promoting in 2024 probably mm-hmm. not going to fire at your store. Uh, no, and I mean, Wizards is so unfriendly to small LGSs anyway, and the way that they do any sort of, like, giving you a leg up to be able to, like, build a player base. Because, yeah, I mean, stores like mine, I'm out in the country, you know, most of this is a warehouse, it's cheap overhead, there's a lot of reasons for why I started the store out here, it's not that I'm expecting tons and tons of customers, but it's nice to be able to service a local community of, you know, 12 to 16 players for Commander Night when we, you know, get everybody mm-hmm. in. That's a and- thrive, look, man, it's, it's so easy to downplay that, and... I understand like why you'd be humble about it, but like that is magic, a thriving 12 player experience on a Friday night is magic. The gathering, it is not a 50 player. It's, it's, it's everything. Right. But like, there's no need to downplay having 12 people having a great time on a Friday night with magic because it's not flashy or hugely profitable anymore. Anything, Right. Like I think that it is an amazing service. That is the reason magic exists and the reason wizards, should and the reason why all customers should value their local stores yeah i agree and uh, you know i'm just not worried about what wizards does i'm not trying to go for premiere plus or any of that stuff even if i ended up purchasing another lgs that was bigger i still wouldn't pursue those things uh are they worth it if that's what you really want to go after sure but i think a lot of the crowds like a lot of my players not only are they like locals out here but a lot of the players i've gained from that are driving 30 minutes 45 minutes to come out and play here are enjoying it because of the more casual atmosphere because a lot of these stores that are having to go after premiere plus and stuff like that are forced into such a 
a, a different kind of incentive level of how they set up events, uh, who they bring into their store, right? Like they don't want commander night every night. Like that's, that's not really doing a lot of good for them. They need to run these standard events. They have to show so many new unique players and things like that. And that's a lot harder to do if you're, you know, just trying to show everybody a good time and not worry about that part. I, I it's, it's nice. They don't have that stress, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, it's understandable. Yeah. Yeah, and there's only one store in our area that's really pursuing that. It's great that they have it. There's now no competition for me, and I have a number of players who come out here that were going to that store that just like the casual 12-player atmosphere more, and that's great. So I'm happy that there's all sizes of stores to exist. I I'm, I'm wish Wizards understood that not every store should be pursuing that advanced level giant play space. You know, lots of stores don't want that, and lots of players don't want that. Uh, so I would like to see a little more support for the smaller stores, but otherwise I think, you know, Wizards is doing what they're doing. The player base is growing. I can't really complain outside of, you know, some sealed product issues and selling on Amazon and stuff like that. But, <laughs> well, we've talked about, we've covered that in depth on this show over the past year or two with yeah, other I store owners and vendors. I think it's been a while since anyone in, in charge at Wizards understood how Magic the Gathering is played at the LGS level and the need for the LGS. It just, it feels like when you bring in somebody whose previous project was fulfillment by Amazon, they're going to have an Amazon based approach to dealing with getting rid of magic cards. Yeah. And I mean, a good example of that is the 30th anniversary product outside of obviously being a terrible product. All those things aside, no, it was the last thing I, I mean, post. That, that's, that's just wrong. Oh, Wait, I went on my finish, Twitter DJ, rant. Let him finish and pop off, please. Uh, oh, don't get me wrong. I mean, that got me frustrated enough to post on Twitter, which I don't know if you guys look at my Twitter over the past five years, but I post like once every other year. So, What is your uh, Twitter, Ryan, so people can find you? Uh, at Cripple Command, but you really don't have to find me because I don't actually post on there. Uh, it's C-R-Y-P-P-L-E and then Command. Uh, it's an old riff off of Cryptic Command. Now we live in a little more PC world where <laughs> I should probably change it, but... Uh, it's going to stay Ryan, that. It's, it's okay, Ryan, Ryan. It's okay to say that Cryptic Command is unplayable. Nobody's going to cancel you for that. Uh, yeah. Oh, I still jam it in any blue commander deck if I can. I love that card. Anyways, I'm it's sorry like, to take I so started to, to take you off track there, but go ahead. Oh, you're good. Uh so yeah, where were we going before that before you dere- Oh, the <laughs> Twitter. 30th anniversary defense. Oh, so so yeah, so the 30th anniversary product. That's uh, if you remove the obviously it was a terrible product element and all that, and you look at it, it's just like a core idea of like, okay, we're going to sell send stores this thing for free and they can sell it if they want to, or, you know, they can keep it and open it or whatever. That product being as expensive as it was obviously eliminates a huge amount of the player base from being able to purchase it. But not only that, you're only giving it to those like premier stores. And even those premier stores, a lot of them were like, well, we don't really know what to do with this. And it just shows that level of disconnect between, like, if you just sent stores even where it's just like, hey, you know, thanks for supporting us for 30 years. Here's a free case of the new set. I, every store would have preferred that if it was the same value because you can move those as individual boxes. You actually have customers for those. And you're not feeling like you're swindling someone by selling them that product if you do decide to sell it. Because it's such a lottery ticket that, you, mm. you know, it, like, just nobody really... I shouldn't say nobody. There was a very small percentage of people that were excited about that product, and none of them that I knew were store owners. Uh, and that was whole part of the hype is like a thank you to store owners. Even the ones who got it for free were just like, yeah, I got sent this thing. I guess I'm going to sell it. Cool. Nobody was like, man, this is the coolest product they've ever sent to store. You they, know, people were more have... hyped about the Avacyn thing the, behind they, you. They're like, like giving the store that is like offering them a career in podcasting. It's like here, here's a career in podcasting, and all you have to do is learn how to edit video and do all this shit. It's like <laughs> there's Whoa. no MSRP on this. There's you got to find one whale to buy it. Like good luck. It just it seems like right. The, your players the alternative happy. is Wizards not sending any freebies to stores. That is sure, an example but- of Wizards sending out a freebie to stores, which they have not done in quite a minute. That was one of the few bones they got thrown. Even if it's just a, even if it was a hard to cash check. I so it show, to, but it showed uh, exactly which the stores practice. they were supporting was my whole point with it. It showed it, exactly it, it, which it stores. It that they don't know how to give somebody something they'll care about. I was right, under it the showed, impression that every store got one and premium got three. Maybe. I don't know. We weren't registered by that point, unfortunately. With uh, We were still having problems with distribution. We got it very shortly after that, but you had to be registered for a while before that, from right. what I understand. And, I mean, the, I think there were... If you are a business owner in the magic space, 
there were plenty of ways to monetize that product, even in oh, such yeah. a way that allowed you to generate goodwill with your player base. So, like, there's a local store an hour north of me, and they, <laughs> up until very recently, still had that free gift from a couple years ago. And, like, if I made an offer on it when they had it, and they declined... And then every time I went to that store afterwards, one of the managers was still complaining that they didn't have money to get chairs. So, like, it's very easy to just, like, sell that thing to another vendor or dealer, take a $200 cut, get $800, and just buy new chairs for your store. And then you're a hero. Then you're a sure. local hero. Uh, like, the, sure. there were so many ways to monetize that, even, like, but, without uh, just uh, you putting a have given me a whole and giving it to, like, a whale. <laughs> You could have given it to me in a whole lot of different ways that would have made it way easier to monetize and made it way more palatable for not just one customer at my store. I, I, and, I hear I, both of you are not wrong here. Selling it, six standard boxes sounds miserable. Uh, uh, no, because at worst I'll give them just... away. Like, and that's a good prize for people. I mean, honestly, the way they should have done it is if you're going to do packs like this, just give one pack and then every customer I get, you know, like you, you write, I don't know, if you got to take down their DCI number, whatever you got to do, I don't think those are things anymore. Uh, but whatever the way to register players is, everybody gets one pack or something like that. You go to your local game store, that's how you get it. I, Anything I mean, like that it, would have been It's better. certainly a long way from mailing every player who shows up to FNM. Yeah, yeah, which is crazy because like well, we had this like very working functional rewards system back in the day that somehow it became... It was a pain became, in their dick. No, it was, it was not. Like, oh, I'm like, sure. why, are we, why are we doing fulfillment? The store should do fulfillment. That was, that was terrible. I understand why they canceled that. that scaled it was so great for me. It was bad for them. Yeah. Right. It worked very well when Magic was a tenth of the size it is today. Correct. Well, sure. Also, sure. they sent $600 worth of cards to my old dorm room a year after I lived there. <laughs> that is rough. Oh, it's just brutal. Wow, Jason's been getting puka traded for years. Get up on your forwarding game, bro. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Michigan State University's forwarding game, and they do not give up. That is a stupid. Well, no. They're Listen, doing that. their homework, and they are getting paid five fifteen an hour. <laughs> yeah, they don't. From care the uh, from the discussion here, I think there's a, a couple interesting points here. That without getting too derailed by thirtieth edition, I think it's super interesting to having a, a, especially a small store owner. Um by virtue of sort of where the rest of us are at in the industry these days, we tend to interact more with like the whole at a GP type person, uh, or even at home, larger LGS is certainly Ryan's side. So, um, no, I think it's interesting. I think that uh, hearing a store owner say, my players are not interested in anything constructed except commander is reflective of a lot about magic over the last few years. And, um, doesn't make me feel great about the future either. I'll, I'll say that. I mean, I like that Wizards is pushing standard play again, but I don't like that I've seen the few people who actually bothered to put together a standard deck and show up at their store championships tweeting things like, three people showed up. Like, they're just you can't, not going to put together a deck next time. You can't push standard play so many years after you've made the standard, quote unquote, yep. you know, for lack of better term, the standard to play online being the only way that it's relevant to play. Exactly. Like mm -hmm. nobody and wants it's even then, to get it's not, back like, in. Even then it's just not relevant at all. It's just the only way right. it's relevant is when it's a competitive season. Um, and, and, and that's that. I mean, they changed it to, you know, to allowing it to be, go back three years instead of two. These are all fine changes, but I, I don't know that they can externally motivate, motivate people. Like they're trying to with the programs for standard in 2024, but it's like you said, it's not just standard. Pioneer, modern, people want to play Commander of the End. Yeah, so I mean, I think, the market the, I think you actually have to go to the opposite. The I think you actually have to go the opposite direction than what they're going. So they extend, expanded Standard out. So now you have to have three years worth of cards, right? To be able to viably play like Standard decks. I yeah. think if you really want to see Standard succeed... Uh, I think you have to go back to the point where you have like some sort of block format where people have a format they can get into very easily uh, because they only have to buy the last set that just came out. If they're getting into magic, it makes it much more palatable. I can, I can walk into the store and like that day know that the product's going to be on the shelf that I can buy for all the cards that I would need from that for that deck. You would think that, that Ryan, but play. you would be wrong because you might also have to buy some jumpstart boosters. Might also no, buy some no, other... that's all going away anyway, right? Like. The point is, they have put cards into standard that are not from a booster pack. 
Sure, the same. Like, but it's, it's but what I'm saying just, is like, I just want to. I just want to. Is it that like, hard to go track down a Lord of the Rings uh, Christmas tin? <laughs> yeah, like is it that uh, hard. I just want to say, like, j- 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 let's not um, under imagine what fresh hell could await us in the future. Um, but look, just, we also I, know I that when they went to a smaller effects. standard, it failed miserably. Right. So it just seems like a dead format. It seems like I, I, if your gate, I, if your entrance, the standard existed to introduce people to playing magic. Now that's what Commander does. What is the purpose of standard? That's, that's I mean, answer that question, Wizards, or no one's going to play. You know, so yeah, but I mean, you need some sort of sanctioned play. Outside, you know, something you can prop a tournament up on to make people care about the like longevity and like how you know there there is a prestige behind like winning magic games. Yeah, that's and called if you take all the, mm. No one yeah. cares about. He's that not format. wrong. I'm not. He's wrong. not wrong. It is called oh, that, CEDH. Yeah, the worst that people in the world awful. run the tournaments for it. It's yeah, a I'm horrible good. space. Uh, this is nothing against anyone who likes CDH. I want to make that clear. I had, I had uh, an incredible I don't, conversation. Corbin's views about not wanting to offend the the majority of the CEDH community do not reflect the views of Brainstorm. <laughs> Go on, DJ. I had an incredible conversation with a client uh, at an event recently where they were selling a bunch of very old cards. They were somebody who's been out of the game for 15 or 20 years, just a lot of pre-modern and old school stuff, just getting back into the games kind of a little bit, just like, oh, I have this thousand dollar worth of cards, I'll get some of this cheaper new stuff and see how see where we're at and then fix my deck or whatever. Um and I explained to them like, oh, this is how most people play now. It's called Commander. It's it's got this rule set where you pick a creature and build around it. And then they're like, oh, that sounds like a much more board game oriented format. Like it sounds a lot more casual than what I'm used to. I, I was always a super competitive player. I, I want, I'm a spike, I want to win. And I said, oh, there's a version of that, it's called CEDH. And they left with the the staples for CEDH. Like, they, they went for their Mystic Remoras, they went for their... Uh, their Whatever uh, else. Yeah, yeah they, they went for all the actual CEDH staples. They got the one of every shock and fetch, and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm building, uh, I think it's Dehada, the Mardu Planeswalker that can be your commander. But yeah, that was it was very, very interesting to watch somebody get back into magic, learn what EDH is, quit then modern in real time. CEDH is, yeah. And then go for CEDH. They're like, oh yeah, I'm a spike. I can just play one of everything and it's still a competitive format. That's really cool. Like I can still build around something and just play to win. Like and Look, the other people yeah. will also play to win. Like it's just a four person cutthroat game. Great. As the oh, poor historian, if, if I still love for it. I love constructed competitive magic, one on one magic. Just the market has spoken based on Wizards' actions. And the few, like, I mean, Ryan, just to give you some perspective, like, content in Magic is dead. Is is all, It's all SEO stuff um, mm-hmm. for the most part. Uh, like, 90% plus percent of things are SEO articles. So let, let's say that you, you can't do the block thing. You can't get people interested that way. Uh, that's not a solution. So the other solution is that Wizards actually has an internal test team that has some idea what they're doing. Uh, and yes, that is throwing shade because they still haven't improved that over the past decade for some reason. And then they, they have not. They, they, there's no way. The, the, otherwise, you would have a product like what I'm about to speak about. So in Pokemon, when I buy my Pokemon allocation, I also get these things called legal League Battle Decks. And what these League Battle Decks are is literally half. So if I buy two of these League Battle Decks, which is 40 bucks. I have a now tier one competitive deck that I probably need to add less than four cards to, and they might be something that came out in the last set that's just like a little bit of an upgrade over something from the last deck. Magic tried that with modern event decks, and they did it with like a tier four deck. Magic's tried that in the past with a number of other decks, and they come out with like just miserable examples of what a competitive deck and standard should be. And so if you could actually execute something where it's like, hey, we know that these will probably be the three top decks in this standard format as soon as we release this and you released ways to be able to buy those decks for a reasonable price all prepackaged because that's part of what the appeal for commander is you're talking talking about event decks challenger decks right but like but challenger decks but an actual challenger deck not one copy of marsh flats in it now you know you have to if you're already driving the price of these rares and stuff down anyway you have to make these so they are competitive they are tier one decks and yeah it's sometimes it's going to drive the price of a shield rid down 
Pokemon players have so been so adjusted to knowing that, like, oh, I know that the Palkia League Battle Deck is coming out in two months, and yeah, the Palkias might be ten bucks right now, but they're going to be three or four dollars after that happens because of that. People will still buy in for those couple months who are really hardcore and competitive, and everyone else will just wait, have this actual tier one deck they can branch off and build from. And standard play for Pokemon is very popular because it's very accessible, and they do this with every release. There's multiple League Battle Decks that you can buy at any one given time that are tier one decks. Uh, and I just don't know why Magic hasn't found the correct sauce with that yet. Because I, I, that's I'm going to throw Commander, this out right? there. I think Magic is Commander a deck. lot more difficult game than Pokemon. Sure. Uh, I yeah. think it's flatly... Imp- I, listen, as someone with actual knowledge of how yeah. they do their testing inside the building... Sure. It's a bunch of data experts in addition to Magic playtesting experts. You. They know what they're doing. <coughs> You cannot Pokemon, predict a year in advance. What? Pokemon decks are so cookie cutter, and it's like it is incredibly easy to foresee the synergies because there's they no interaction. And you can't tell like, me that you can't figure out like what good competitive decks are going to be in standard for Magic. At what good competitive them, decks are going to be? What's the best deck twelve months from now, Ryan? Nine months. I don't know. I don't know Magic that well. Why would I? Why what's would the I best deck in Pokemon nine months from now? Nine months from now. That's when Wizards uh, has to click print. Right. Well, you could probably keep track of it because they like do a pretty good rotation of like this type gets a boost in this set, this type gets a boost in this set. <laughs> uh, I would venture that Charizard EX will still be very playable in nine months. Uh, I would guess we'll probably have a Fortress variant because we'll get a Leaf Green set by then. Uh, but again, like these things are se- semi predictable Pokemon. I get that. But like uh, the point I'm getting at is that like Magic has these pre constructed Commander decks you can buy off the shelf. It's not mm-hmm, intimidating mm-hmm, to get mm-hmm, into Commander mm-hmm. because I can buy this off the shelf and play it. They Correct. do not That's have. Completely they fair. do not Your have a is, standard yeah. equivalent, and I without a standard equivalent of that, yeah, without a standard equivalent of that, it's very daunting to get into standard. And now you know you're under the gun to learn this format, play this format as much as you can to get your money out of it before it rotates. Yep. Cool, the three-year yep. rotation helps with that, but it's still a lot for a new person coming the in. The like, three-year rotation also makes it feel like you got to buy three words, three years worth of to switch decks, or and you do into the format. That's the point. That's Your that, that's even is... more daunting than two years, I think. So, like, it's a double edged sword. I don't yeah. think it's I don't think it's as daunting with the export of data. Like, you have so much data thrown in your face about like what a deck list should look like, and the player expectation should yeah. be to like be able to walk into an LGS, show your phone screen, and say, "Can you pull this for me?" And then where the cutoff becomes is like that LGS having trouble stocking those cards, like getting it. Getting three years worth of cards is not the issue. It's like you should be able to go into your LGS and be like, hey, I want this deck. It's just like the LGS can't fulfill that right now because of the increased number of variants, because how cheap every card is, because of what it costs yeah. to pull a card. Like that right. is where the breakdown is, is like tweeting. Like, I want hey, this deck find- to cost $12, but I want somebody to assemble it for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But honestly, in Pokemon, it's the same way. Uh, decks are very cheap. So, like, that part of the, like, breakdown isn't necessarily over, like, it's not something you can't overcome. Uh, I just think Magic has a major issue also with the fact that there's no incentive. So, not that I bust open a lot of Pokemon product, but there's a lot more people buying and selling regularly because Pokemon has this much larger collector base that doesn't really care to play the game. And right, so they're the, selling you, you their standard staples much higher rate than you're getting from Magic players, right? Your boxes in, are so so aggressively subsidized by like being able to get $20 per thousand on your bulk. Yeah, I mean, the, the bulk rate's down a little bit right now. But yeah, like the the um, that that does help with it. But it's, it's the fact that, like, you have a lot of these collectors who go, oh, I want to keep this alt art version of something I brought, and I'm going to send it into PSA or whatever. But the rest of these cards, I don't care. So, like, I'll sell all my bulk Vs or EXs or whatever off. And they love just trading that shit into buy more boxes, right? And in Magic, you don't really have that. And not only do you not have that, but if people are just buying a pre-constructed commander deck and then a couple of singles, well, where did those singles come from? Because I don't have players incentivized to come in and buy cases from me anymore because the prices are so low. I'm not incentivized as a store to bust open a lot of product. So where, so not only do you have the breakdown of not being able to pull these economically like for a good price, but also you just might not have access to the cards. That's like, what there's I mean. a, yeah, there's a lot of it, stores around that just don't carry singles really correct. anymore in my area because there's not much you can do with them and you've got to have exactly that single. And if you don't have it at just the right time, it's just like Yu-Gi-Oh! It'll drop in price so much that you got hurt by buying it. Yes. And the, the logistical challenges for your average game store between juggling online and in store inventory is incredibly high. 
Yeah. Like you, you really do have to pick a lane when it's either just do all your business online and, and have a display case that is effectively a display case. And then you have a kiosk and you point to it and you tell people to order their cards there. And then it, it goes through the same process your TCG player store does, or you force you online entirely and you just kick it nineties bedrock style and you have this like archaic sorting system that involves relying on higher margins and issuing tech and sorting processes and all of this. And just like, we got it all sorted by color. We got the new stuff. Here it is. It's two X TCG player deal with it. This is how we make our money. The, like, and neither of those are conducive to the process I mentioned before, which is like a standard player walking up and showing you a deck list that they want to buy for a hundred dollars. Right. And yeah, I couldn't do that. If somebody brought me that deck list, I'll fully admit our store would not be ready to do that. I would be go, well, here's our singles. That. And that's, here's that's our singles that are one is... to $10 that aren't good to put online. And here's our bulk rares at a quarter. The cards you're looking for are probably in there, or at least in some quantity, but I can't make promises, you know? Yeah. And it's, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like the Wizards has also pushed this, you know, this on stores to where you're almost only a commander friendly store in the way that you carry inventory too, right? Because like that box of quarter bulk rares isn't going to do that standard player much good because they don't want to look through a four row for six cards. But that commander player is going to find 15 other cards they, before they get through the end of the first row that they didn't even know they wanted when they got into that box. And those are fantastic deals when you're dealing with that customer base. But yeah, for like a standard player or, you know, even legacy or modern players, it, you just don't really have the inventory sorted in a way that makes it conducive to be able to find, you know, the four ponders they want or something like that. They're just in a box with other singles because they're so cheap now. Yeah. So yeah, it, it does definitely hurt smaller stores, but I would say that bigger stores, you know, some of them have the capability to do it. Uh, it's just a lot to keep up with, even for them. I don't even know if bigger stores can do it because of the issues we saw in Atlanta last month or earlier this month, where it's like people were trying to find pioneer staples, tagging large game stores near Atlanta and then nobody can fill orders like that. That's a real issue that, that we have is like even huge stores can't bring inventory to events because of how many variants and like you can't predict the metagame. Like store owners can't predict the metagame. Game designers aren't going to be able to predict the metagame a year out from now. Like players just have to shift their expectations. Yeah. And they want like everybody should have, like multiple play sets of a thousand different potential pioneer cards, but also I don't want to pay more than 25 cents for a card. Are you I me? Mean, right. So like, what is a store supposed to do? Yeah. I just I tell people to, to go on too much. I just show people how to put a TCG order in, like not even through our store or anything. I just, here's TCG player. When you want to buy specific cards like that, this is where you go for that. Make sure that you have your deck ready for the weekend or whatever in advance. If you're just looking for commander singles, singles, this is a place where you're going to have a blast because commander players, they, they don't just want to go and order that hundred card list, you know, like they will, but a lot of the times the adventure and joy of like building a commander deck is finding cards that you might not have even known like about, or you just buy other cards for like, Oh, I'm going to build a deck with this later on and stuff like that. Like the, that player base is a lot easier to cater to, which is also a reason that stores are catering more to that player base, right? Like all of this leads back to commander is just so much more accessible for the store, for the player. It creates a much more symbiotic and easy to maintain inventory for both uh, mm -hmm. the, like, I just can't see how you shift away from that either. Like, wait, wait, what format can you push that's going to make, that's going to be easier for a store or for a player than commander? Like, all you gotta do is make sure it's in your color combination. There you go. And not banned, I guess. I did find that's out there was some cards banned. I EDH forgot about when I went for stores. Do you have a play set of this? No. Do you have one do of you these? Do you have one of a yep. bunch of different crap? Yep. Oh yeah. Lots of it. Yep. Have fun. Well, and when you're getting a new player in too, right? Like they don't want to go on TCG player and have to like buy on this unknown website from a bunch of people and get 30 packages in the mail. They want to just look through a bunch of cards and pick out things that look cool to them. So it's much more accessible for new players too. Like, yeah, I mean, Commander is probably the future of Magic, but I don't think it has to be the only future of Magic. And I just don't know how you get I to... think it's the like future of paper Magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you know, a big part of Magic, like, is sitting down from your across from your opponent and like engaging with them, right? And having a good conversation, having a drink, whatever it is you guys are doing together while you're playing Magic. And Commander's much more enjoyable for that. It's much cool. easier to set up than a tournament. And, you know, and nobody's salty at the end of a Commander game most of the time. 
well, not as salty, at least, the, than the guy who lost his wooden in a, to a top eight, right? Like, I, as a store owner, don't want to deal with that guy if I don't have to. I instead would much rather deal with, like, this dude who got blown out by a combo the turn before he was going to win. And everyone can just look at it and be like, yeah, dude, it's Commander. Get over it. Let's play the next game. Only a Commander player can be as happy as Brian Kibler was to be uh, beaten by a top deck bonfire. Yeah. Like losing to a top deck a miracle card in EDH is hilarious. When there's money on the line, I would not be happy about it. Right, right. You know what everyone's happy about? This is when we do Breaking Bulk and Pick of the Week. Uh, uh, breaking Bulk time. Breaking Bulk time. Break, break, break. Oh, yeah, Breaking Bulk. There's so much good stuff. It's a pick. Breaking Bulk. The end. Uh, 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 I was waiting for uh, it. That was that was awful. Well, you know what's not awful? Well, the the episode's almost over. You know what's not almost over? My breaking bulk pick, which I have a real miserable one for y'all as a as a Ryan special. All right, let's do oh, it, boy. Well, well, it's every token from. Uh, well, as a reminder, I'm already all, mad. <laughs> as a reminder, all of these picks come courtesy of MTG Stocks. Dot com, the generous sponsor of this podcast, a great place to find magic finance content, uh, a great place just to catch up on all these prices that we're talking about. Scroll through uh, sets and see what you can afford, what you might not have thought maybe about. Maybe like we historically about. somebody contributed articles to MGG stocks and they're still there. Maybe you can go read those articles. Maybe there's still good information to be had there. Maybe you could go check that on TGstocks.com and definitely check out the premium side of the website as well. Uh, they do a lot of good work and we are happy to partner. with you. All right, Jason, let's dig in with your breaking ball. Okay, cool. I'm going first. Blue you said you were, cons. you said you were ready. Yeah. Blue cons on Conman. Is Slitherblade uncommon? No, that was common. Uh, you said what is what's that? Blue cons uncommon. Cons. Blue cons uncommon. Goodness, cons of Tarkir. I was doing the con scream from the Star Trek movie. Is it the uncommon uh, enchantment that like whenever you tap oh. or you like pay one to tap a thing whenever you do something? Oh, I know, I know. what he's talking about. Quiet contemplation. I think. Yeah. No. You All mean right. when Spock yells con? Yes, when Spock. Well, that's not what the focus is right now. Did you not see the movie? When Spock yells Khan, yeah. When Spock was like, Khan. I watched the movie. That's what happens. Wait, did Spock yell Khan in the new one? There's only one. I ah, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jason, they swapped you it. You could travel the new back one. in time. Cool, so you're going to stop your planet from being blown up? No, I'm just going to kill a guy. What? <laughs> yeah, so uh, no, they did in fact swap the uh, Kirk and Spock role. Oh, I I forgot that because I walked out of that movie, man. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead with your break your bulk. A uh, blue cons uncommon. Tie game scheming. That's a common. Uh, uh, water uh, whirl. Oh, what's the what's the counter spell? The one mana one. Stubborn denial. Stubby D. Stubby, Stubby D. D. What's called, bro? <laughs> That's what it <laughs> likes to be called. Is that the card? No. Yeah, Stubby D, baby. Oh. <laughs> I have never heard that card called that. Um, Nor has anybody else. I hear no, they have. Every day. <laughs> Play more magic, I guess, boys. I- I've heard, I've heard Bedevil. I've heard Ravinica. I've heard Goblin Matron. Uh, and now I have heard. <laughs> Omni stuff- Science, baby. <laughs> Omni Science. <laughs> Kitchkin was always my favorite. Kitchkin. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that guy's still alive. Wait, is that Kitchkin? Uh, he or is. K- I saw. Kitchen? I saw him like two years ago. It was rough. I was at Hester's house this weekend. They were talking about him. I think he's still alive. Wait, is is that supposed to be Kitchkin? There was a guy kitchen? locally that used to say Kitchkin. No, but I understood that. But is that is that for Kitchen Finks? Is that Kitchkin? No, Finks, no, it... no, Kitchkin. Okay. Yeah. Kitchen I did make a Kitchkin. joke like that. He said something was in my kitchen, and I said, "Dennis, it's Kitchkin." Jesus Christ. <laughs> obliterated him take that it was anyway uh dj you have a ryan special let's hear it uh so i'll give you a pretty big hint as to what this is uh it is one of these sticker cards from infinity don't oh, care is it the one with the, it's the one with the goblin it's got delusionary Mind goblin, word, bro. Right? yeah Wait, corbin or er, ryan what'd you say delusionary goblin right it's the delusionary sticker he's right no one cares though 
<laughs> Dang, I've been picking my bulk get... lately. Dang, I got the a Lunar Goblin. Uh, the the full name is Playable Delusionary Hydra. It's got a sombrero on it. Oh. Yep. It, <laughs> uh, this one sells for like between three and five dollars. That's yeah. fucking rad. Why? And, wait, wait. Because because well, it goes on the Goblin. There's a card called vowels. Blank Goblin, which everyone yeah. refers to as you put Mind, mind on Goblin. It. Why would you right. put Mind on it? Mind Goblin these nuts! <laughs> Great. Wait, wait, audio cut out. Scott, God, that was on real time. There's no way. I did. There's yeah. no way. Yeah. Wow, we got him. You got real. Me. Yeah. That's what you get for not paying attention to magic, dog. You Holy had peace of mind shit. for five years, but you missed the one meme, so fuck you. You missed Mind Goblin these nuts, bro. <laughs> what? Why would I know? Why would I know about that? that I don't know. Two running it's jokes the on this cast. Goblin? Was the mind Goblin, and then Corbin. you ever heard anyone say Mind Goblin without it being followed by these nuts? No, no. Hey, wait, I've never the, heard anyone say other, Mind Goblin. Period. What's our other running joke, Corbin? What's that band that you say you never want to see? It's Imagine Dragons, bro. Imagine dragging these nuts across your face. What? <laughs> Hunter Slayton gave me that one. So yeah, we can't say one. the F word, but we can talk about dragging these nuts. Good. Oh, we can say the F word for sure. We'll bleep it out. But um. So anyway, uh, yeah. Imagine JJ bleeping all of this and being like, you know what? Patrons only. F- you guys, uh, we give you pores enough. <laughs> Patreon.com. You want to see what they're you want to hear what they're saying. As a genuine yes. offering to Ryan, uh, there is a three drop goblin in the set that generates more than three mana when you cast it when you play with stickers. So it is actually a playable card in Legacy Goblins. Yeah, you play in Muxus. Uh, and, right, yeah, you you play the blank goblin into Muxus and then you kill them. Um yeah. this sticker, this playable delusionary hydra, which is the three words on that sticker. Uh, it actually has velocity, which is crazy. I checked TCG player. It sells on average like a few copies per day. Just okay. at, at a I'm reasonable glad you checked. price. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. people have paid as much as four to five dollars for this sticker. This what's this, this? You put it on the goblin, or you put it on something else? Yeah. So the, the goblin, goblin, the goblin states that it's however many vowels are in the word is how much red mana it, it adds. It costs three, and because you get all five vowels in Delusionary, it adds five red mana, which puts oh, you one away so from Oh, so put it these is, it is just a two together goblin. gives you a, a, yes. a super duper. Yeah, mana. it is just and a I'm goblin really sh- that is dark ritual. And I'm not really sure how it works in Constructed. Cool. You're supposed to, it says on the back of the sticker cards, you're supposed to bring 10 different sticker sheets, but I'm guessing people don't do that. They just bring 10 Delusionaries and say, here you go. It's always going to be Delusionary, because uh, it doesn't... I have like one friend who plays with ones. some... I have a friend who plays with attractions in our The group. rules do say they have to be unique sticker sheets. You have to have 10 cool. unique ones? Correct. It says bring... I'm reading the back of the card right now. Right, Bring at yeah. least 10 unique sticker sheets, no repeat sheets, uh, etc. So that's why I think it makes between 3 and 6. I think you can finagle it so that it always makes you some amount of mana and is RNG-based. Uh, I know on Moto, I think it just always makes six mana, which is crazy, but I... I sure. We'll hear yeah, in the comment section about machine. how we're I would, I would make us watch this episode in, like, 2014. <laughs> I would make so many different life choices. Well, you see, uh, let's move from sticker sheets into Lord of the Rings gift tins, and then the Fallout uh, no, decks, and then... You'd have broken the timeline, because we wouldn't have kept recording. <laughs> yeah, I know. Would have been no more brain servers. <laughs> True, would have. Uh, oh, yeah. this game need a close. Oh, we did an April Fool's episode on January first. That's weird. Why would we do that? Yeah. Oh, are we? <laughs> All right, Ryan. That far uh, advanced now. We're so prepared. Ryan, show us some of these. Uh, this old, this old school skill coming back here. Do you have a breaking bolt? Uh, sure. Land for more of the spark. Uncommon. Uh, Access one tunnel. that gives everything flash. Access right. tunnel. Nope. Uh, DJ the Dash other one, the the one you it, emergence it's got reactivation something? maybe emergence, emergence zone? zone emergency zone emergence. yeah or emergence zone yeah uh yeah I discovered that one when I was doing War of the Spark bulk the other day and that's cool <laughs> it's nice nice to see that there's like a random random more more War of the Spark things besides just the planeswalkers are coming up and then obviously Dovin's veto that was a nice one too that was a very good set War of the Spark was a fantastic set terrible yes. book fantastic set. Yeah. That was also one of the few sets where, so we've talked a lot about, I mean, during the main segment, we did a big tangent on like collectability and how magic can improve it. War of the Spark did that right. War of the Spark was one of the few sets where they put a 
very, very cool chase version of a card in a box said, go get it. And people You're talking about the Liliana? For, yeah, people hunted yeah. for a $2,000 Liliana that was drawn by the Final Fantasy guy. Let's do that again. Yeah. I mean, hidden treasures in, like, the Zendikar, also same thing. That worked. You know, like, there's a lot of options to be I able to say. That, that, that one will never work again. <laughs> Why? Well, they went for on the one, secondary market and bought they, cards to put in those for, packs. What DJ like, said for one. <laughs> back then, yeah. a beta source of plowshares to surprise a player was like $40 or less. Probably. Yeah. So like, right, but you don't know. Go- speaking of beta f- swords, my buddy got it. It was beat up. It was like out of someone's deck. Yes, they bought them off the secondary it was amazing. market. Amazing. Okay, yeah, but yeah, you you can't you can't tell me that somewhere around Wizards HQ there isn't like a giant stockpile of old ju- judge promos. Wait, or something cards? Like that. Could, they have, could they do yeah. old legends? Legends, cards? maybe Ryan. What about legends? You know what they should have done? They should have gone into Worth Wolpert's office and gotten <laughs> that box of test prints he had. He brought like a one k box of test prints to Vegas, and he's like, "Are these worth anything?" It was amazing. Ryan, if, if you you're not one of the, if you put those, if you got old like. Test prints and stuff like that, that incredibly rare stuff. Yeah, that 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 that's that relevant to nobody, man. <laughs> that's they can't do that. That's they can't do that. It's relevant to nobody. It's, it's relevant to nobody pieces. because they don't have at scale. This is the whole point. They could do all of these things when the game was smaller and they could go buy the beta stuff off the secondary market. You can't do any of this at scale now, which is why we you got just 30th do it on a smaller edition. scale and people have to buy more boxes. Mm-hmm. I think that's uh, we got 30th edition instead. Oh boy, that was so, a while. We got coal in our stocking. Yeah. All right. Before we get out of breaking bulk, I'll stump you all to wrap it up. I've got a green uncommon from Phyrexia. All will be one. Uh, the triumph hey, thing. Tyrants. Nope. Tyrants. Something. Nope. Uh, Tivar stand. Nope. Tricked yeah. you. Got you. Get wrecked. Try again. Is there how many cards were in that? Set? Oh, that was an aftermath. Never mind. That was a lot. <laughs> It's a normal set and it's a normal uncommon and it's worth eighty cents. Does it have infect? No, nothing. In because set. nothing in the rate. set has infect. Does it have uh, Phyrexian uh, oil or whatever the fuck? toxic? No, it uh, doesn't have oil counters. But to further toxic? answer your question, it also does not have poison. Does it? I thought does it was. It, it's toxic. It's is toxic. it the? Is it? Is toxic. It, you don't even know. Wait, toxic Corbin. gives poison Corbin. counters. Corbin. Yeah. It's the version, like, there's a werewolf that, like, naturalizes things. Is it the Phyrexian version of that? That's such a cop-out. What? what? Yes. I know the card's effect. It's like, pay one and sack it to naturalize. I don't know anything yeah, about Yeah, there you go. Well, you missed the, yeah, you, you, you got the first part of it. Yeah, DJ, you missed the third part, though, which is that the third option is to proliferate. Um, sure. Yeah, canker bloom. Oh, is that is canker the bloom? Yeah, there you go. Yep. Oh. I should have As I said. I, that that's so obvious. I I didn't even think of it. It wasn't. Cass you talks f- about that card all the time. Got him. Got him, Coach. Got, all right. What do you mean, got him? I got the card. Yeah, it's a green creature that naturalizes. You're Get you're gonna imagine dragonsing me. <laughs> Look, I I I imagine I would dragging agree, this segment out any longer. <laughs> well, how about that this was, next one? That was then? a good segue. Let's talk about secret layers. Now we've talked a lot about this thus far. It's sort of in, in broad terms. Specifically, there is a change coming to Secret Layers. They are no longer going to be print to demand, where everyone who orders one in 30 days gets one at some point in the future. They're going to be um, print to a certain amount. So they're going to print a certain amount and then sell them until they sell out. And the benefit of this is that Wizards gets to print their things much earlier and therefore can get it to customers much, much, much sooner than they could before. Uh, the downside is that there are now not infinite copies of a popular secret layer. A popular secret layer will be collectible to the people who get to the website first or buy it on the secondary market because as a result of the, the printing change, so they is, are limited to the amount they can print that they choose like to print ecolo- originally. Economic stimulus for scalpers. Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, that like depends on whether or not the wizard's though. website That's... is set up. I know they have limits about how many you can buy. Also, like the Everyone who makes that argument is just skipping over the paragraph where they say yep. we have four years of data and we can print to demand because we have four years of data to anticipate demand on the things that we make. Yep. Are they going like, to announce how much they're printing of any given thing? Probably no. Not. No, of course not. Yeah. Like, I'm saying that I'm saying the lim- the 
the capped limited nature of it changes the economics of it. A yeah. little bit, but like a bunch of people bought the Here Be Dragon secret lair because they saw it was only 10,000 were ever going to exist. And then they ate, yeah. they ate crow on it because like it was not a great thing that everybody wanted like everyone like oh it's dragons it's limited let's buy it buy it buy it. and then you could yeah I, I guess if they're like they're doing no longer printed demand but they're printing about what they would have anyway then right and that's the thing and so change that the much. other side of that is there have been secret layers previously that were print to demand that became limited print run because the demand was low at the time and the demand went up later like the cat secret layer the one where the mirror is yeah. like 80 dollars or something that one was print to demand, but it was like nobody wanted it. Nobody bought it at the time. Nobody cared enough to to get the cats because it was one of the first secret layers. It's like, oh, whatever. That's this is weird. Maybe I'll buy it. And nowadays, you have like the Arabo and all those other cards that look like that are very expensive. And if it's print to demand, if it's if they if they figure out a limited print run for that one, they're like, oh, people love cats. We'll make a lot of the cat one. I think that. There, I saw a lot of discourse, of course, as we all did across the internet, of people who don't like the change because they're worried, essentially, that people will miss out. And I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I feel like some amount of people may be missing out on a secret lair. People uh, have missed out on secret lairs for the past four years. I, I know, man. Yeah. I just, I'm just i reflecting what is that the idea that some people who could buy within a limited window cannot necessarily buy if they're going to sell out within 20 Get a credit card. Yeah, I mean, I have no skin in this game. We Secret have we have tools to solve this as a as a society. I I, Ask I think someone my one for help. I think my more basic point was going to be that there's a trade off to literally everything. This is how they're going to get them into customers' hands sooner. People they're luxury bad. products in a luxury game. What are we even doing? Also, this is a this is likely a direct company response to the secret layer coin flip deck taking a year. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what do you want? Well, surprise. It's a ninja assassin out of the alleys with a segue. This is a hop assassins creed IPA from eight bit work sent to me by Eric Lopez. Give Eric Lopez a job. If you want to give Eric Lopez a job, write us an email at brainstormbrewergmail.com and uh, you could win the Give Eric Lopez a Job contest. There you go. Jason, and, um, as somebody who is looking to there hire... There was one near, winner of that contest. Jason, as somebody who is looking to hire in the near future, what are what are the credentials that Eric has? What Sell them for me. Oh, he's a front-end developer and he sent me a CV and I definitely didn't lose it. So if you send us an email, I'll uh, list all of his all right. credentials there. There you go. Please do, everybody. And... uh. <laughs> that's that's it if you didn't know ryan that's the send jason a beer get a shout out second. yeah and, you know, he sent me three beers yeah. so he gets another one in the future True. until True. someone gives the man a job why why everyone's like nobody wants to work anymore you know who wants to work <laughs> eric lopez eric <laughs> and lopez <laughs> well uh we appreciate you listening eric we appreciate you sending jason some beer uh, i'm gonna <laughs> get you a job if it kills me and on that mind. note on that note let's uh Let's talk about Jason's other favorite. Uh, let's 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 reframe this. There's one job on the shelf, and Jason is Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it's time. Go all the way to your unemployment <laughs> line and tell you to get out of it. It is time for pick of the week. Pick of the week. Pick of the week. Pick of the week. Time for the pick of the week. I'll jump in first. I'm coming in hot with a standard pick. I said that right. A standard pick. Despite what? everything we've talked about, there are some places that play standard. More importantly, there's a lot of people who want to be on the pro Are those floor. places called arena? Uh, part of it. More importantly, though, there's a lot of people who want to play on the pro tour or who want to play in the regional championships. There were 1,300 people at the regional championship in Atlanta. The largest ever oh, invite I only. F&M. I really do, man. What? I miss F and M. Don't you, you go to F and M, bro? In public? <laughs> I don't know, man. There were look. Here's what I know: there were 1,300 people who qualified, who won qualifying tournaments to be in the largest ever invite-only Magic tournament. And those people played the hell out of Pioneer for the three months preceding it across 12 different regional championships across the world. If Wizards wants people to care about standard, there is a a percentage of the player base that is going to care about standard. 
And on that note, Jace, the perfected mine out of Phyrexia, all will be one, has climbed from three uh, to about over five dollars now over the past uh, month and a half. And I think it's just going to continue because we're going to hit a standard RCQ season and a standard RC season. And these cards are going to matter. Jace, by the way, this particular one, the Phyrexian one that can mill yourself. Also the preferred win con for any Kethis deck that pops up anywhere ever. So uh, yeah, things to keep an eye on is Jason Perfected Mine at $5 out of Phyrexia All Will Be Four. All right, DJ, we'll get you in here next. What are you looking at this week? I'm looking at an old faithful, a card that many of us have bought and sold several times. It is also from Phyrexia All Be One, uh, but it's originally from Apocalypse. Any... It's it's Phyrexian Arena. This isn't breaking bulk, man. What no, are you doing? No, it's, it's, it's pretty... <laughs> it's I'm letting arena. the listener engage with the podcast. It's a choose-your-own-adventure for two seconds. I appreciated it, DJ. You do you, fam. Phyrexian Were you arena. screaming in your car at your desk? Maybe. Maybe. I'm maybe they... engaging with the... Wow, podcast. Jason. Job really too soon for Eric. Too soon. <laughs> uh, Phyrexian Albi-1's version of Phyrexian Arena... <laughs> That one really got me, man. Corbin's dying. I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> Phyrexian yeah. Arena uh, was a bundle promo. It was printed to death in uh, its most recent set. All of us decried the death of the card. I was putting it in, like, basically bulk bins at events, and people were just, wow, man, I used to pay $10 for that card. Yeah, well, now you have to pay at least $4 for the card. The Phyrexian version has slowly crept up to around 4 and uh, as it continues to fade, I I think they gave it quite the healthy printing the first time. And yeah. if they avoid giving it another one in which in, they won't in soon, <laughs> uh, I think it can make its way back to ten. Even though the card has been power crept by black market connection, there's there's plenty ten. Of it's not even good anymore. There's plenty of reasons not to play the card, but people still do. So <laughs> DJ's right. That that was the the first lesson we learned at EDH Rec. <laughs> we stopped asking, but why? And we stopped arguing with the data and just reported it. Yep. Huh, I guess nobody knows how Obeka works. Okay. <laughs> Wait, All right, was, Jason. Was, was somebody picking a card that just does not like a, does not work with a commander? Was that a frequent card? Every card on Obeka's page, it said like threat effects and shit. It's like, oh, if I end the turn, stuff that says at the end of the turn doesn't. Uh, yeah, it does. At the end of the turns, when you tap a Becca, dumbass, and like seriously, every card on that page was like uh, didn't work with Obeka correctly. <laughs> that's incredible. Yep, Obeka's like, a tricky commander. That's what happens. That's All right, Jason, what are you looking at for pick of the week? For great, hey, my card's five eight commando. Nothing bad. It was awkward happened earlier. Uh, it's from March of the Machines commander decks. Put it in your modern decks. It's under five dollars. Is incorrect on this card. Low supply, very, very, very high demand. Like, there's acute high demand, but there's also just, like, general high demand because it's an angel. So when you got two things going for it, both the the um, type and the effect, that's double the demand, baby. So pick up a saucy angel like Fireman Commando today. Oh, and also the extended art is only a dollar more than non-extended art. And, uh... That seems like the play, perhaps. Yeah, certainly could be. All right. Appreciate those. Ryan, you are the guest. Are you going to leave us with a pick of the week? I got one. It's uh, it's more of a high-end card. Uh, I okay. think Jeweled Lotus is probably in a very good position where if you still want one at under, under $100, I would snap by one pretty quickly. Uh, I don't think we see a reprint until at least next fall, probably, if not longer. Uh, it took less than three months to fully recover in price, and it's actually much higher now than it was before the reprint. Uh, uh -huh. The cards recover so fast. It's one of those cards where it's kind of like doubling season back in the day. People could justify paying the money for it because they go, oh, even if I don't play this commander deck, I will find another commander deck to put this card in. It will never be something that just sits in my binder and sees no play. And I think that everyone who you know really wanted to buy one while they were cheap uh, got in there and drove the price right back up, but it's not stopping on sales. We've kind of plateaued out a little bit, but again, I don't think that there's any more supply coming in the short term. Obviously, you can always be wrong about that, but unless they <laughs> jam it in one of these, like, you know, Fallout Commander decks or something, I oh, just don't... Would, that, 
would, would be, be really something. weird first off <laughs> that would like, be something <laughs> but yeah like outside of something crazy like that happening right like i think jewel lotus once it pops off is going to be it's just going to double in price over the course of a month or well two. look i'm gonna i'm gonna say this I'm, I'm looking at the card now ryan it is in fact already a little more expensive um by 10 20 10 15 percent than what it was when it was reprinted a few months ago so the, the yeah. graph is certainly looking um looking the way that you are talking yeah, and uh, uh, and that's on the most that, recent printing. Yeah, it's gonna be like any of those cards that people are like, oh, it's a little expensive. I don't want to pay for it, and then all of a sudden it's double, triple the price, right? Like, so what do you think that means? Though? I mean, you think it's gonna be a two hundred dollar card? Yes, I believe so. I don't know if Wizards wants. I don't know if Wizards is going to allow that I, to happen. I think there I, are very, very strong structural barriers to things passing Mana Crypt. Um. I can see it getting close to Mana Crypt. I don't think this is a bad pick. I think picking it at like 90 or 95 and having having yeah. your copy before you pay 130 or 140 is fine. Um, yeah. But there are very, very strong psychological barriers with things passing Mana Crypt. Well, Mana Crypt has been climbing as well over the last two months now. But but again, look how many times Mana Crypt has shown up somewhere, including as special guests. I think that... And now, this is just my take on this. Wizards has blown through a lot of reprint equity over the last few years probably going to continue doing so. I think that things like Jeweled Lotus or Mana Crypt, instead of using those as your flagship mythics to sell a set and keep and push it down every year or two, like doing the special versions of them, like the secret, the the, the guest versions, like CI is probably right. what I would, what most people who are thinking about spending $100 on a Jeweled Lotus would probably like to see. I don't think, like, it, it makes it difficult for people to spend money on Jeweled Lotus if the expectation is that it, Wizards doesn't allow $100 cards that will get printed into the ground well, within so two years. My experience is like the the, sh the shop and people coming in when I yeah. had Jeweled Lotuses in stock from opening them, right? So Or yep. like buying them off players or whatever. We had a lot of people who were like kind of bumming at first. They were like, oh, my old Jeweled Lotus dropped down in 20 bucks in price or 30 bucks in price. But they didn't take that opportunity to like sell it and be mad about it. They bought two more. Because they were like, now it's, you know, this is the only time I'm going to be able to buy into it. Like, nobody was really mad about this reprint. And I think it would take at least two more reprints before people started, you really started seeing that price, like, get dinged. Like, I think the next reprint even still. But is I also think the people that weren't buying it until it was 70 are not going to buy it at 110. So, like, how does it get to 200 without people paying more than they were willing to before? Well, it's been climbing. Over the because, past few weeks, because, right? So, well, like, we've seen that happen with cards historically a lot, actually, where the price will stagnate out because people are waiting for that first reprint. But then that first reprint happens. Like, doubling season is a good example. It dropped and immediately spiked back up. And all of a sudden, doubling season is like not untouchable. Obviously, you print it three times in a year and it gets hit a little bit. But, like, it's still an expensive card. People still want it. People, it's still in demand because you could still think of a bunch more decks that you would put a doubling season in. And I think this is the same way where, like, people saw that, oh, it didn't completely fall out when it got reprinted and now i feel more safe buying in at that hundred dollars knowing that it recovered so quickly before i want and to I, yeah, I just want to inject data here i'm not arguing with anybody uh uh doubling season the battle bond which is like the last big like a big reprint before they started just hitting it and everything or whatever before the the last year in january 2023 a year ago it was 90 dollars. today it is 40 dollars. however but still two months two yeah, months listen two months in... stop, two months ago it was 30 dollars yeah. right and okay. it's so be 60 even with year. all of those reprints, even with the card just getting absolutely crushed in price from 80, 90 down to 30, it has still, even after the reprints, continued to climb back up. So I think as long as a card is still, in fact, playable in Commander, but lots of times cards in 2023, or 2024, I guess now, it feels like lots of cards may be expensive or because of scarcity. And then when they finally do get a reprint, you're like, yeah, it's actually a card that just sucks now. And then it just becomes worth nothing. Yeah, uh, so I will I will put my two cents here, and by that I mean I will put my six hundred eighty nine dollars ninety three cents here. Uh, I had Card Kingdom store credit just burning a hole in my pocket, and I am a fan of this pick enough at ninety dollars that Card Kingdom had several of them at ninety dollars, and I just bought them all. Jeez, this go. is some old school brainstorm brewery yeah. show. Um, so I, I like I said, I very very <laughs> rarely am willing to just buy a spec. But I had CK credit burning a hole in my pocket, and I am confident enough in the liquidity of a Jeweled Lotus down yep. the road that I am very happy if these sell via social media or some other like outlet I have. If I just get out at 90 and turn my CK credit at one-to-one -one yeah. rate, I am very happy. Yeah, yeah. that's a, it look, seems that's, pretty that's easy great. to do with that. Um, 
Yeah, and I mean, also, this card, like, only gets better over time, right? The more monocolored or two-color commanders we get, the more Correct. playable this card is, so... Yeah, there's, no, there's really... no, 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 Ryan, Ryan, they're gonna make Jeweled Ur Lotus, and it's gonna make four. They're gonna make this yeah. absolutely... Well, it'll, oh, they'll okay. add, they'll, they will make the one eventually that allows you to make three colors in any combination. I, they've got at least five years before that happens. I, 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 I think that we can buy some time <laughs> yeah. with Jeweled Lotus. Will it be magic in five years? Oh yeah, I mean Commander's Eternal now. I think Commander's a board game, like Commander is. Well, Monopoly. Commander's a board game where it, it continues if they print new cards for it or not. No, I don't. I think, think so. that like, Commander I, I will think, live regardless. Yeah. They could stop printing cards tomorrow. Look, the difference is that I think that the only the difference that we are likely to see this is my belief. You know, over the next year or two, is that the actual thing that sells the cards or like pays the bills at Hasbro or WotC or whatever we're talking about here, which is Commander, is not going to change. However, it's sort of like point of emphasis in an, in a pro league, right? Their point of emphasis for 2024 is probably standard, right? Based on everything Huey said, right? So like the, the things you, there's a lot that Wizards can do as a company just by sort of where they put their weight that is not necessarily the product lines themselves, right? So like, Commander, I agree, going nowhere doesn't mean they won't try to make something else the next hype thing over the next year or the point of emphasis for 2025 or or whatever. Just like over the past year, it was Magic Cons, you know, go do Magic Cons, get a festival in a box if you can't go. That was the emphasis for the company. Yeah. So, yeah, um, and it's going to be that all of that said, and, and it's good thoughts. We'll see where things go forward. I love seeing... Oh, uh, DJ by on the cast. Remember, we got those Master of the Pearl trains, Jason. <laughs> that was a it's the best one that's ever worked out for us. That's it. How'd that go? I think we bought a bunch at like two bucks, and within like yeah. a and few we months, for six. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> it went very well. We did it on. The, I think Jason got mad because I made it a pick or something, and he just rage bought them. <laughs> the only one I can never there was escape is there Death was Shadow. a uh, there was a wall on TCG player. Somebody was selling a bunch of copies themselves, and I was just like, I was buy this guy out. Of here. <laughs> like nobody seems to remember anything from me being on the podcast, but every once in a while, somebody will bring up, "Oh yeah, that you're the Death Shadow guy." I'm like, yeah, thanks for the oh, money. Yeah. Cool. Oh, we remember all kind of stuff. You falling asleep. Yep. Yeah. Don't forget summoning. that one. Savage, Savage summoning. summoning. Savage hey, summoning. That, that yeah. card. That card is like. No. Nope, nope. You're not. Nope. Kind of, nope. Kind of a little better than bulk now. <laughs> it's like at the top end of Better bulk. than bulk. It's top end of bulk. Love that. Classic I category. I will, Listen, I will give sense. him that one. I will give We're him that one. We're being so unfair to him, and it's so much fun to be unfair. I know. Because if you go back and listen, <laughs> I will give him that one. Uh, my Roka does pick it. It is above the pick threshold. Savage Summoning is a card. Win. You can miss the robot, card. dog. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a legacy. Listen, I'll take this. I'll share um, Nick Wright's uh, philosophy from SF1. He says there's three types of opinion. He has three types of takes. One, immediately correct. Two, flat out wrong, couldn't be further from the truth. And three, eventually correct. That That's, that's kind my, of the same as wrong that, being Two wrong, out of though. three specs always hit. Mm -hmm. That is a, look, that is a classic category three for you there, Ryan. Yeah. You weren't wrong. You were just a decade ahead of your time. Uh, eventually correct is kind of the same thing in investing as being wrong, though. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> if, no, you can be wrong twice. If you buy... At, if you buy too early and sell too early, you were wrong twice. If you're only wrong once, you're right. Oh, I did get paid <laughs> off on one recently, actually. Uh, so when Throne of Eldraine came out years ago, I bought into like 400 fairy recently? harbingers, thinking like, Ooh. oh, fairies are back. Excellent. And then uh, I was, you know, they moved <laughs> with me back here when I moved from Brian Denver was the thing else. And I, I, no, I haven't sold them yet. Like, I, I need to. I'm we know. <laughs> Nobody uh, has. But they're they're sitting in a box, and I did sell a bunch oh. to Card Kingdom. I filled their buy list one time with like forty of them or something. But and I was like, cool, made all my money back. I looked, I paid like eighteen cents to like eighty cents, depending on which. Oh ones. wow, okay. So like I bought. Yeah, the, I mean, look. we're talking Throne of Eldraine, like way, way, way long ago. Yeah. So that's like my most recent spec hit. Accidentally did okay. I had those, and I had uh, was it is uh. Gonti's Aether Heart or whatever? Is that the other one that like uh -huh. paid yeah. off? Yeah. Oh, Gonti's yeah. yeah. I had a bunch of those in the nice. box too. I was like, ooh, spicy. Honestly, so. any energy card, it's purple mana. Don't sell your purple mana cards. They're going to go up every four years because EDH. 
Well, that's, I mean, yeah, especially when you start, I, I, it seems like with um, the fallout stuff, I think is the thing using energy. Is that true? Yeah, yeah that's a nice, it's yeah. a nice way to find a mechanic that proves terrible for actual constructed magic and work it in a way that makes sense. So the one with poison and Phyrexia. Yeah, you're walking around with old uh, pre-war fusion cores. Yeah, that's true. That makes yeah, energy I mean, make sense, baby. They had to change it, but yeah. <laughs> so I, I have to ask, though. Why is it that the legendary uh, spells from Dominaria aren't aren't good? Like that's one of the other things in my spec box. I have like a half a row of each, and I'm just sad. Like the white one's okay, but the rest of them. I thought the powerful. black one was very very. The black very one's good. the best. The black one's the best one. By but they're far. all like solid. Like if you read any of them, like the red one is certainly the worst, and even that one's like oh, that's a lot of damage. If you're late in the game, like none of them are. Bad. Isn't Karn's temporal sundering in that cycle? Yeah, yeah, that takes an extra turn and you exile. Like that's great, and you put a legendary permanent in yeah. play or something. Yeah, that's fantastic. Like, why is that? Why are they're hard to trigger? Like, they're a very hard to. They're very difficult to trigger. How? All you have to do is have your commander I, in play. <laughs> I understand, but like I don't know. That's I think that's the answer though. Is that it's a real drop. I probably picked those to go up two years ago, so I sure shit don't know either, man. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. that's that was the only one in my holds where I was like, ah, this one could still pay off, I guess. The rest of them were, like, uh, like pretty bad. Truecraft Exemplar, I thought that might see some modern play at one point. There was some pretty some pretty big misses in that box. Yeah, like, we've, uh, we've got we've moved into the bulk rare box, boxes. Right? Yeah. I accidentally sold DJ some of my shame boxes when I sold my collection. Oh, no. <laughs> my next, uh, I've got 100 flumps in my closet. That's my current. No. Did you buy hmm? too late? No, I didn't like the number. Like I, I followed it very closely. I got them all for under a dollar, and I could have like made a little, or it you, wasn't. You worth flumped it. up. No, I didn't. I didn't think it was worth it. In fact, I'm you still happy. You flumped up, man. Look, if they spike again because it's still a combo piece, which is relevant in Pioneer as well now, it's still going to spike hard. I mean, I didn't need it thirty cents on each copy. I'll just wait. I spent like. 50 bucks or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, this is fun. This is a little magic. Sure, I'll give you a hundred bucks for your flumps. <laughs> Probably not, buddy. At a hundred flumps, like bro, the them. Well, maybe I could buy, maybe I'd do that. Maybe I could buy a hundred new flumps. I don't think. Why don't you expensive. sell me half for 50 bucks? Mm, then we're both in on it. I'll have to see what I paid on them. Maybe I will. <laughs> I want some of that flump action, baby. I just want some personal. I flumps. feel like there's got to be some good. And then some here, walking around just, flumps. Yeah. I kind of want to have a little. Need yeah. extra flumps for the road. Little cushion. <laughs> I deeply. Uncomfortable. All right. Well, hey, Ryan. Thank you again for coming on. We appreciate yeah. it. I think we even went a little long. People are always asking for. The I'm going to make so sure people at Wizards listen to this one. Oh no. The plight of the the twelve man LGS in Dansville, Michigan, is <laughs> is going ignored by the mainstream magic media, and we're going to change all that. Well, yeah. yeah, Ryan, thank you to you for coming on. Thank you to our sponsors, MTG Stocks, as well as Coalesce Apparel and Design, where you should go and use the gift code Brainstorm Brewery right now when you're done with this podcast. Oh yeah, also, get a hoodie too. The hoodies are really comfy. Uh, I don't uh, really also go to plug other than my store. But yeah, go to Ryan's store. What's it called? Masterpiece Collectibles. If you're in mid-Michigan, we're very centrally located. There you go. So, go check it out, everybody. Thank you for listening. I want to also take this opportunity at the beginning of 2024 to thank everybody who at any point of the year in 2023 or any time before that was a, a supporter of us at Patreon.com. I know we've talked a lot about magic content being down. We've talked about magic in some ways being down and other ways being up. But it is absolutely true that 2024 is looking like one of the most difficult years for creators in the space. So uh, I just want to, to say that in way of saying thank you for everybody who supports us at patreon.com slash BSB. We really appreciate our community and what you allow us to do to bring you this podcast uh, to, to, to pay our editors and our thumbnails and all of that. So we, we really appreciate all of you who make it possible with your support. So thank you everybody for listening to Brainstorm Brewery. We're looking forward to a great 2024. Bye, everybody. Hi, Eric Lopez. <laughs>